Vince Man, I told Alicia, I said, I'm ready to roll. And I got pages and notes, and I'm studied up and prayed up and ready. And last night, I was driving home from watching Tim Hawkins. We had date night, and my jaws hurt from laughing so hard. If you've never seen Tim Hawkins, he's a Christian comedian. you got to look him up, man. It's so good. But we watched him, man, and it was fun. And I'm driving home last night, and um, Alicia was talking. I'm not sure what she was talking about. But uh, she was talking about something, and I was doing the, huh? Yep. Gotcha, babe. <laughs> look beautiful and talk to me all you want. I'll just look at you and smile and I don't know what she was saying, but the Lord started speaking in my heart. It must have been something good. Because probably the Lord started speaking in my heart about all these different people in the Bible. That it was time for a change for them. You know, and they were in a period of their life. Some were some were demon possessed, some were saved, some were just people going through their normal life. But for all of them it was time for a change. And I started to think about my personal life and how there's been so many times in my life. Where I've needed to change. You know, if you ever get comfortable in your Christian walk, I've heard it said very often, that's a very dangerous place to be. You're in trouble. And I've thought, oh, okay, man, if you're ever comfortable with where you're at with the Lord, you're in trouble. You're about to go into a crazy storm because God loves us enough not to let us be comfortable. And as I started thinking about all these different people in the Bible that went through these things, man, I said, okay, God, but what do you want me to do about all these notes, man? I had one specific story down, and, and needless to say, my notes are scrapped, and I'm just going to preach to you from my heart this morning. So, Sharon, good luck. Good luck back there, ladies. I'm sorry. Uh, her finger's smoking and the, and the computer's going around. But, but I started thinking, first of all, about this man named Blind Bartimaeus. We'll just call him Bart, man, in the Bible. And this man was blind, and he stood by the road day after day, hearing people, hearing kids scuffling by, hearing horses p passing by with carts that were attached to it. He went by, but he was blind. And so he couldn't see what was going on. He would just take it in and he would be able to hear it. But there was a time in Bart's life where he said, I can't think of one person when I think of Bart. I'm going to have to say Bartimaeus. There was a time in Bartimaeus' life that he needed a change. He needed something different to happen. And I want you to listen real quick as I read this story. And then we're just going to go all over the place in the Bible. And I want to talk to you this morning. But it says, and they came to Jericho. And, and as, as he was leaving Jericho, his disciples in a great crowd, Bartimaeus, he was a blind beggar. So he stood by the side of the road every single day, listening to people come by, and he would beg. He would ask for, you know, hey, do you got a dollar? Do you got some food? Do you got a chicken wing? I don't know what you're giving me anyway. I'm blind. You could give me a button. And I might think it's a coin, but he would beg because he needed stuff. He couldn't do anything on his own. And so he would stand there and he would beg all the time. He was the son of a man named Timaeus, I think you pronounce it. He was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, listen to this. So many times in the Bible, the woman with the issue of blood, Jairus, the, 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 the ruler, the governor, you could say. All these different people never had an encounter personally with Jesus before these times in the Bible that we're going to look into today. They heard about him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How does faith come according to the scripture? Hearing. hearing. Hearing and hearing by the word of God. So you might not have had an encounter like you hear preached about up here yet. You might still be doubting. You might still be blind and begging for anything. I don't mean physically blind. I mean spiritually blind. Right. You know, when you come into a service like this, that's why I had to come up here and lay down and just, just get myself on the floor, man, because I could see myself blind in some areas and begging. And Jesus says, you don't have to beg when you're my child. I got everything that you need. Amen. What are you begging for peace for? What are you looking for and anything else in this world for? I have it, and it's right here. You just have to receive it. Because I've already given it to you. But he was sitting by the road, and when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, what did he do? He began to cry out. Now, this man just wasn't like, Jesus. Jesus. Because someone was beside him, and he thought maybe they would hear him. Why don't we sing in church at the top of our lungs sometimes? Why don't we pray out loud? How many of y'all have been asked to pray and you almost, you almost d disappeared into your clothes? <laughs> Why? Oh my God. What are they going to say? If I, what if I say his name wrong? What if I stutter one time? He said he began to cry out. And all he did was hear about this man. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. 
Amen. That's what he was saying. Bartimaeus realized, I'm sick and tired of being blind on the side of this road. And I heard that this man healed. I heard that this man has raised the dead. I've heard that this man is a miracle worker. He's the son of God. He's, a, he's from the lineage of David. That's why he called him son of David. He said, have mercy on me. What's mercy mean? Someone shout out your definition of mercy. Nobody knows. Holy smokes. Have mercy on me. Hold on. Is this... Where are we? Can we read our Bibles? It's all through the Bible, I promise. About 747 times it talks about mercy. What is mercy? God, give me what I don't deserve. Give me what I don't deserve. It's walking into a courtroom when you know you're guilty. And the judge looking at you and saying, case dismissed, you can roll. That's mercy. He said, Jesus, son of David, has mercy on me. And listen what happened. Many rebuked him, the Bible says. What? Many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. Mm -hmm. They said, man, you're a blind beggar over here. Leave him alone. He's got a mission. Him and his disciples are doing great things. They're going out and preaching to multitudes, and they're feeding 5,000. So just keep it down over there, Bartimaeus. We don't want to hear you whine and beg anymore. Just be quiet. Just sit over there in the corner. You ever feel like that at times? God, I can't cry out to you because I'm just this beggar and I'm not good enough and I'm not as good as them and I don't, I'm don't. i not like Donnie and I can't do it like Alicia so I'm just going to sit over here and be quiet in the corner. I have, people that, I have many people that, that even this week have said, people have asked me, why do you still need to go have Jesus? You just got your jail sentence and you're going to have to go do your time. You don't need it anymore. And he said, this isn't something that I have to do anymore. This is something that I want in my life because I've been an alcoholic my whole life. I've lost all my property. I've lost all my possessions. And I'm crying out now, have mercy on me. Amen. And even though he's going to jail, he did go to jail. He doesn't have that long, a couple months, and he's going to come out. And he's going to go away at almost 60 years old to a year-long program because he says, I'm ready to have something different in my life. Have mercy on me, Jesus. Amen. I don't want to do it anymore. I don't want to be begging for bread anymore. Yeah. And David said, I've never seen the righteous deserted or begging for bread. And we don't have to do that. And many rebuked him, telling him, be silent. It says, but he cried out all the more. Yeah. Amen. How many of y'all in here, when I just said, raise your hands, you felt weird? <laughs> Two. Three. <laughs> all right. We were honest. It'd be a lot of us. Why? Why? Tell me why. Why was it weird? Someone, someone in here might know you, right? And they know your past. They know what you've done. And they know your situation. And it feels weird to be like, I don't, I don't know. It's awkward sometimes, man. But, but right here, man, he said he did it all the more. It was all the more reason. He was less than in society. He was a beggar. He had to be able to depend on you to make it. But he heard about this man named Jesus, and he started to cry out, Have mercy on me, Jesus, son of David. And even though people said, Hey, why don't you keep down over here? It says he did it all the more. Yes. Which means he didn't care about what anybody thought at that point. Amen. He didn't care about backlash. He didn't care about looking like a fool. He didn't care about anything. All he knew was he was in a situation that he didn't like. And he heard that there was an answer, and he began to cry out, All the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And in every translation I found, there's an exclamation mark, which means he was crying out with authority. This is the ESV, that's the NLT. Both of them have exclamation marks, because he was saying it with every ounce of his being. <coughs> You hear me this morning? When we're singing out these songs in place of freedom, I'm not talking about singing so the praise team feels good that they're up here and you're singing with them. I'm talking about it's a cry. Yes. Have mercy on me, God. I need to be in this place of freedom because there's a place that my eyes can't see right now. But I know that this is the closest thing that I'll ever experience on earth that I'm going to experience in heaven is when I cry out to you 
in worship and you begin to touch my heart. Yes. Amen. And if you want to go to heaven, right. why wouldn't you want to be in that presence? Amen. Why wouldn't you want to get a little taste of what you're going to experience for life That's and right. not give a give a anything? I guess crap's not good to say in church. You say crap, but I guess that's not. It's just who I am, not giving crap what anybody else thinks. I'm trying to think of another word for crap, but. Dung. Couldn't think of one. Dung. I was going to say to my little kids. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I was going to say little kid words, I guess. I'm used to saying all kind of stuff. But <clears throat> you know what I'm talking about, man. Because we just need to have that. Yes. I need to have that in my life. Amen. And listen, I'm going to say something that might sound harsh, but it's not. You should be able to say the same thing. I don't really care what you think about that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Because Amen. I know what it's like to stick a needle in my arm and be bound. And I didn't care what you thought then. That's right. Amen. I know what it was like to eat bottles of pills and drink till I blacked out for a whole week at a time and wake up in the back of truck in the woods not knowing how in the world I got there. I didn't care what my family thought. I didn't care what you thought. The only thing I cared about was being numb. Right now, I don't care what anybody thinks. I need Jesus. I need to be able to get in his presence That's in right. that place of freedom. That's right. Even if someone says, shut up, we don't want to hear it anymore. I'm going to say, well, then roll out because if you're around me, you're going to hear it. Amen. Amen. Because I know what it's like to be bound. I know what it's like to be saved. I know what it's like to be set free. But I also know what it's like to go through hardships even though you're saved. Amen. And I know that we need to continually change. And the way that we do that is we become like blind Bartimaeus. And even if people say, why does he act like that? You say, I don't know why. I just know what I need. And I know I haven't ever found it here on this earth. Amen. Ever. Yes. So I'm going to praise the one that can give it to me. I'm going to glorify. I'm going to cry out all the louder with an exclamation mark at the end of my praises Amen. because I need the one who can set me free. Yes. Amen. Amen. I don't need a bunch of theology in, 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 in the deep. I'll learn that and that'll help me in my personal walk with Jesus. It's good to know those things. But what I need is the presence of Jesus. Bart didn't have time to get a bunch of theology. <laughs> All he knew is he heard about a man that came to this earth to be to, to set the captive free. And he said, man, I'm blind and I'm begging and I don't like it. Jesus, have mercy on me. Shut up, dude. Why are you being so loud? You're just a beggar. And Bart had that, I, I, I call it um, what, uh, glorious defiance. Like Jesus did when he came in on that triumphal, triumphant entry on that donkey, man. He should have been hiding. People were get him. And that was his way of being like, here I come, man. It was glorious <laughs> defiance. And that's what Bartimaeus did. He said it even the louder, as loud as he could do it. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped. Are you with me? For one man, Jesus leaves a 99 and goes after what? One. The one. Jesus stopped immediately. And listen what he did. And said, call him. The same ones that were saying, dude, shut up. Leave him alone. He's got a work to do. He's got a great work to do. And he's on his way to do it. So I just want you to be quiet. He's about to go. And these are the events right in the next chapter that led up to the crucifixion. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Jesus has a work to do. He's going to go save the world, so leave him alone. He's on a mission, and, and Jesus, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, hold up. I hear your cry. That's right. Blind Bartimaeus, they don't think you're good enough to have an encounter with me. They don't think that you're even worth being called by your name yeah. because you're blind and you're a beggar and you're just a bum that stands over there. And if I have a little bit of extra, maybe I'll throw it to you. That's all you are. But Jesus didn't see him like that. And it, it, Jesus thought he was important enough to stop what he was doing. He was going to die on the cross to save all of us. Yeah. But Bartimaeus was important enough to stop for in that moment. Yeah. And Jesus turned around and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart. Uh -huh. Let's get excited. That's where your emotions are at. That's get right. excited. Take heart, Bartimaeus. Listen, you can be excited. Jesus called you. And if Je they already knew what was going to happen. If Jesus called you, you're touched, you're changed, you're different forever. Yeah. Amen. Let me share something with you. Jesus called every one of you. Amen. He's calling you right now. Right. I don't care if you hear it on the TV or, or on your phone or you're here today. Jesus right now has stopped 
And he's looking at you and he's calling you. Yeah. Saying, man, and the disciples said, take heart, get excited. This is an emotional thing. Get excited. Yes. You're about to be touched, Bartimaeus. You're not going to have to beg anymore. You're not going to have to be blind anymore. You're not going to have to be led around anymore by your hand. What's that step, Bartimaeus? Because you can't see it. You ever feel like that's what's happening to you in life? Mm -hmm. I sure have. Sometimes I'm so mentally exhausted, I just have to depend on Alicia to get over this rope right here. Why? Just because I'm wore out and I'm tired and I'm struggling. Praise God, we have each other to do that. Yes. Yeah. But if that keeps going on and on and on, there's a problem because there's a man that can open up my spiritual eyes and take off the blinders and I don't only really see what's in front of me and God guides me, but he gives me the strength to leap over that and never have to look back at it again or trip over it. That's what he was doing with Bartimaeus. He was saying, come on, son, get over here, take heart. And then Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? I stinking love that. What do you want me to do for you? Man, I've had a scroll of things. I want to see. I want to be the best looking dude in the world. Give me a wife. I don't want to have to beg anymore. Give me a horse and a carriage. I'd like a house. You know what I mean? I'd like to be able to see what I'm smelling. Man, give me something like that. Man, I'm sure he had all kinds of things that he could have said. What do you want me to do for you? You think Jesus already knew? Absolutely he did. When he said, Son of David, have mercy on me, Jesus already knew what he needed. But the Bible says that God wants to do exceedingly abundantly above anything that we can ask, think, or imagine. Amen. Amen. You know what I can imagine in my mind for my kids and for family care and for my wife and for the church, all that. It says that God wants to do more than I could ever ask or imagine. That's right. I can imagine some pretty crazy things. That's right. <laughs> Man, God wants to do exceedingly abundantly. In another translation, it says, more than we could ask or imagine. So he says, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rab Rabbi, which means teacher, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, did he touch him? He had to do nothing. He just heard his cry, and he said, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Did you hear that right now? It says immediately he recovered his sight and followed him along the way, man. Bartimaeus had an had a, had a issue way down deep in his heart and in his life. And he had this spiritual blindness. But he heard about this Jesus and he cried out to him. And there was opposition. And then he cried out to him anyway, even more fervently, sincerely, more passionately. And the people that knew Jesus, which should be us. You know how many Bartimaeuses are out there on the streets? Yes. We should be the ones that run to those people and say, hey dude, take heart. You just said you needed help because I know a man that touched my life and I've seen him heal and I've seen him set free and I've seen him make fake parts work again that aren't supposed to work again and I've seen him bless families and I've seen him do all these things. Take heart. Amen. That's our way. We should be saying get excited church. Yes. Yeah. Why are you sitting there thinking about your problems or somebody else right now? I'm talking about you. Right. Get excited about Jesus and what he can do in your life. And it says immediately. He was made well. Immediately. Immediately. Yeah. Immediately. <laughs> Someone can at least smile at that. Chicken wings. How many people just smile? Stupid. <laughs> Holy smokes, we got it wrong. <laughs> Immediately, he was made well. This man, can you imagine him every single day being on the side of that road, what that would have made him feel like? Can you imagine that? But immediately, because of his cry, he was heard, and he was healed, and he was touched, and he began to follow this man that healed him. Amen. Amen. I heard Mark mention the church today being little slim pickings on this side. Listen, we can run to everybody. It's not just about being like, hey, you want to come to church? That's no. Right. That's right, Did I want to come to church? No. no. Was I made to come to church when I was in their house? Yes. yes. Did I ever want to go to church? No. Why? 
Because I wasn't crying out for Jesus. Right. It was pointless. It was four walls and taking up my time to sleep before I watched football. You hearing me? But if we're in a place where we're like Bartimaeus and we see, man, that we have issues in our life and that we need to get where he's at. Yes. And we need to cry out and say, have mercy on me. Not have mercy on my wife because she was hateful this week. <laughs> <laughs> have mercy on me, God. Because I'm in a place where I need you. That's right. And whether everybody's here or everybody's not here makes no difference. I still need him. Amen. I still need his touch. I still need his freedom. Right. So whether you choose to go, and I'm preaching to this cross right here, and I'm saying, thank you, Jesus, that's what I'll do. Because that's what I need in my life. I need him to do that. If you go to Luke chapter 8, it's one of the most exciting chapters in the whole Bible to me. It is so amazing to go through Luke chapter 8. And just like Bartimaeus needed a change, there was many other people in the Bible that needed a change. They were in a period in their life where they were struggling and they were having a hard time. Some were saved, some weren't saved, but they needed a change. And how did that change come for Bartimaeus? He cried out, he cried out and he had an encounter with Jesus. How is change still going to happen to us today? Man, I get so frustrated with these worldly methods of trying to help people that have issues. Amen. And I'm like, don't you understand it's going to keep failing 100% of the time? Amen. They've been trying for over 100 years to fix this garbage, and it's never going to be fixed until you understand that you're a blind and you're a beggar. Right. You're less than without Jesus, but when you cry out, have mercy on me, and you have an encounter with Jesus, you all of a sudden become set free immediately, and then you begin to follow him, and wherever he goes, there's freedom. Wherever he goes, there's people being added to the kingdom. Wherever he goes, there's peace. Wherever he goes, there's wisdom. Wherever he goes, there's words of knowledge. Wherever he goes, you're okay. Yeah. So how do so many of us get off track? Yeah, that's right. Because we quit following the one that we cried out to in the first place and we get our healing and then we say, okay, God, thanks. Appreciate that. I'm going back to doing my own thing now. But we have to continue to follow him right. like Bartimaeus did, like so many others did once they had a touch. And if you look in Luke chapter 8, there was a man that they called Legion. He called himself, the demons inside of him, called themselves legion. And Jesus and the disciples were going over across the Sea of Galilee. And, and he says, man, we're going over here. And then let us go to the other side. And in this chapter, there is so much that happened. It's awesome. Right. There's this craziness that comes, man. And these waves and these storms come in. And the disciples that had eh, faith, you could say. But then what happened when Jesus said, what, we're going where? <coughs> to the other side. To the other side. Did Jesus ever say anything that he doesn't mean? Mm -mm. Jesus said that you have overwhelming victory Amen. right now. That's right. You hearing that? Amen. Jesus said you have overwhelming victory through Christ. Amen. Jesus said I can do all things. How many? All. Oh. All things through Christ who gives me the strength. Does he not say that? Yes. Does the Bible say that you're a new creation in Christ? Yes. Does the Bible say that you're loved with an everlasting love in Jeremiah 31.3? Yes. Does the Bible say that you're accepted yes. into a family? Holy smokes. Does the Bible say all of these different things? Absolutely he does. So we have to take that and receive that Amen. and walk in that. This storm came. And it's raging. And the disciples are freaking out, man. These are fishermen. This is what they do. Yeah. This is normal. You ever see someone that cuts down trees and they'll steal to the top of the tree with nothing? Remember, dude, it Joel. tells Joel. Dude, you, <laughs> I'd literally be in my office looking out the window and you'd see this guy just go Pew! straight up a tree. And I'd be like, with nothing. Did he just go to heaven? Did the rapture just happen? <laughs> what just happened? I'd go outside, dude, and he would be as far up. I mean, he looked like this big with a chainsaw. Man, no ropes, no nothing. And I'm like, he probably cut down 300 trees in four hours. I mean, that dude was on it. And I was like, what? 
This would be like Joel who knew how to do this stuff and the wind started blowing and all of a sudden he just froze up there and was freaking out and screaming, I don't know what to do. That's what was the disciples. This is what they did. This was, their, this was their livelihood, their life. So when those storms started coming, Jesus just said, I already said we're going to the other side. He back and was sleeping. <laughs> I need some rest. Yeah. And the disciples are like, we're all going to die. The waves, are, the waves are coming and the storms. And, and, ah, and they were screaming and they woke him up. And Jesus looked at him and was like, where's your faith? Peace, be still. The disciples needed a change. They needed their faith to grow. The disciples needed to see that Jesus was not just good with his words. It could heal people, but he was the master even of the waves and the wind yes. and the earth and the elements. Yes. Amen. And Jesus could speak to any storm that was raging and just say, chill. And it would be calm immediately. Yes. With, the, with the water all of a sudden looking like glass, not even choppy anymore. They needed a change in their faith. They needed to do something great. And they get over across that, that sea, that lake, and they get to the other side, and they come out, and there's a demon-possessed man that they couldn't keep bound. It says he would break out of his shackles, and he was naked, and he would live among the tombs, and he would get rocks, and he would cut himself. Yep. That sound like today? Mm -hmm. You know, people that cut themselves, and that's what this guy did. And it says no one could tame him. He was crazy. He would break out of stuff. He was nuts. And Jesus came over to the other side. And I can't believe the end of this story blows my mind when you read it. I'm not going to read it for the sake of time. But he gets over there. And, 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 and man, Jesus said, what is your name? And he said, Legion. And Legion means many. I forget exactly how many soldiers were in a legion, but it was a whole lot. I didn't write it down, man, but he said legion for many demons, it says, had entered him. And they begged him not to cast him out. <laughs> they begged him not to cast him out. Are you with me this morning? It says now a large herd of pigs were feeding on the hillside, and they begged him, let us enter those pigs. And so Jesus said, okay, and when the demons came out, they went into those pigs, and the pigs ran down and jumped in the water, committed suicide instantly, drowned. And the people went to see what happened from that city, and they found Jesus and the man who the demons had left. And the Bible says he was sitting clothed and in his right Amen. mind. Yes. Amen. At the feet of Jesus. He was clothed and in his right mind. He wasn't naked anymore. He wasn't breaking out of garbage anymore. He wasn't screaming. He wasn't intimidating anymore. He had a perfect peace yes. at the feet of Jesus, totally set free from anything. And you know what the people's response was? They didn't say, praise God. They weren't clapping. They weren't saying, you are the Messiah. They were mad and they asked him to leave because the pigs went and drowned themselves. What? So instead of seeing this man who needed a drastic change in his life and he had an encounter with Jesus and the demons fled from his life and now he's at peace and he's sitting clothed and in his right mind. And man, what a miracle from Jesus. Amen. But what the typical people do? Ah. That ain't nothing. Ah. This is a life. Amen. This is the one that Jesus leaves the 99 and Amen. goes after yeah, right. and changes their life. This man needed a change. He had a place and he needed to change, man. And he experienced it when he had a when he had an encounter with Jesus. Then Jesus keeps rolling and he comes back over. And here's a man named Jairus who was a governor. That his daughter was dying. Jairus needed a change. He needed his daughter to be healed. He needed something great to happen. He needed faith. And he came over and Jairus did what about Jesus? He heard about him. And he ran to him. And as soon as he got off the thing, he sprinted. And he said, Jesus, will you come with me? My daughter's at the point of death. I need you. I need you. How many have kids in here? Imagine if my little Sarah was at the point of death. And I knew if he didn't come, if something didn't happen, she's a goner. Man, I am going to be begging, literally begging, pleading. Jesus, you have to come with me. I heard you could heal. Please come with me. Please come with me. My daughter needs you. 
He needed a change, man. He needed a change in his family situation. He didn't want to lose his little girl. And it says immediately, Jesus said, all right, let's go. So they started going, man. And, but there was another lady who had an issue in the same chapter. Hear this. She needed a change. She had an issue of blood for 12 years. Now, you can imagine what that is if you're a female, what the issue of blood was. Which meant she couldn't be with her husband. She couldn't be around her kids. She couldn't cook them dinner. She couldn't go to church because she was considered ceremonial unclean. She couldn't go to church. She couldn't do what we do. So she had to be by herself. And it says she exhausted everything she had on answers and on doctors and on natural remedies and on everything that she could possibly do. And she was totally at her wit's end. And I, I picture this. I had a dream one time about this woman and what she looked like. And I dreamed about this, this home that she was in that once had like kids and memories of her husband and a family and these beautiful things. But it was jacked up and run down. And she was sitting on this. It was like a, like a pottery that was turned upside down. And she was sitting there like this with her shoulders slumped over just crying, man. And there was rags from all this issue of blood that just would not stop bleeding. And she was just so defeated. And her head was down and this had been 12 years 12 years of doing everything she could to find an answer everything man did she need a change and she heard this rustling outside and she heard she seen all these crowds of people she wasn't allowed to be out there among the people she wasn't allowed to be she couldn't walk down a crowded street she would be put to the side. You ever feel like that? Like the beggar. And like the man in the tombstone that was cutting himself. And like all these different people that we see or the disciples in the boat where God says, you have victory. And the little bit of, little slightest bit of sight that doesn't look like victory. And what do we do? Oh no, we're not going to die. Jesus ain't real. What's he doing? He's sleeping. He's not listening to me. Where's he at? <laughs> This man was in the same place, and, and this woman, I can just picture her sitting in this room, totally defeated. I don't know what else to do. But then she heard these crowds, and she heard about this man named Jesus. Then she heard coming in her window all these people saying, he's here. Jesus is here. Jesus is here. He's in our town. He's two blocks down. Jesus is here. I just heard he's with Jairus. He's going to his house and, and his daughter's sick. He's going to go heal her daughter. And Man, Jesus is here. And that lady sat there and I can picture her head all of a sudden coming up and saying, you know what? I need a change. Amen. I don't want to have an issue of blood anymore. I need something to happen. So what did she do? Did she lay on her ground and pray, Jesus, if it's your will, please, God, let him come to my house. It's not what she did. God, if it's your will, let his shadow just come by my house. And it's not what she did. It says she heard about him. She seen that he was here. She got up. She worked her way through the crowd. She walked. She's not allowed to be out there. She didn't care anymore. Bartimaeus didn't care anymore. What anybody thought of him or what people said, be quiet, leave him alone. He didn't care anymore. Jairus, or the lady with the issue of blood, went out, was bumping through the crowd. I used to do it now because if I do it at home, she'll hit me back. She was pushing through the crowd. And she pushed through the crowd and, and she got to where Jesus was at. And I can picture her with the hood up over her head so no one recognized her because of her issue and her shame. And she gets up to where he's at and there's his garment, there's his robe touching the street and he's with Jairus. He's on a mission. He's on a mission. He was on a mission. In, in the other scripture that I read you out of Mark, he was on a mission. But the blind man who was asking something from him stopped him. Mm -hmm. He's with Jairus and he's on a mission. And this lady with the issue of blood crawls up to him and she just says, I just want to touch his garment. And she yeah. reaches out and just touches the edge of his garment. Yeah. And Jesus stops immediately. He stops. If I'm Jairus, I'm ticked off. You said you were coming with me because my daughter's dying. And I showed you how urgent I was. And you just stopped with this lady who's not even supposed to be here. I'd have been like, get out of here. You're not even allowed to be here. But Jesus stopped and he said, who touched me? And his disciples are like, come on. Because the Bible says if you read that chapter, that, that, that there was throngs of people yeah. around him. Yeah. Which meant like last night's thing with Tim Hawkins. There was people shoulder to shoulder as far as you could see on the street and they were just moving with Jesus because that's all you could do is move or get walked on. 
And they said, what do you mean someone touched you? There's throngs of people around you. And he said, yeah, but this was different. Or I perceived that power came out from me. I perceived that virtue left me. Someone touched me. What he was saying was, someone touched me with a desperation. Someone needed a time for change. Someone needed a change in their life. And they were exhausted. And they were tired. But somebody got to the place where they touched my garment. And I perceived that a healing went out from me. And the Bible says that in that very second, immediately, that woman's issue of blood was dried up. And she knew it. She felt it. She felt it was dried up, man. And Jesus looked at her. Now imagine that. This woman who was able to just get up and rejoice and go hug her kids and go hug everybody and be excited now. She no longer had to be isolated from the rest of everybody. She now could run freely and do whatever she wanted to because she had an encounter with Jesus that brought about a change. Amen. Hear that. Now, Satan's going to attack and try to get you to change in the same ways when God's trying to get you to change. Because right after that happened, this miracle should have boosted Jairus' faith. He just healed that woman. We know her. He just healed her. But it says as soon as that happened, Jairus' family walked up and said, Hey, don't trouble Jesus, the teacher, any longer. You can just leave him now because your daughter already died. You ain't just be done with him. You don't need him anymore. You don't need him anymore. Come on. That could have ruined Jairus. Mm -hmm. You ever have something that you really think, man, Jesus is walking with me and doesn't go quite like you think? Mm. And people say, man, I don't, I don't need him anymore. What's the use? What's the use? Jairus could have stopped right there, but and I bet you he was close to. Mm -hmm. Because I'm a normal man and I'm a dad. But I know what I would have went through if that would have been the situation. But listen what happened. It says immediately Jesus, and I'm just paraphrasing, I'm not reading out of here. Immediately, Jesus spoke up and he said, hold up. She's not dead. She's only sleeping. Let's continue to roll. Amen. You're about to see a change. There's going to be a time for a change, man. He said, your daughter's only sleeping. And they're like, they just keep. And he gets to the house and it says they were wailing and making a scene. And Jesus was like, oh, yeah, go. You got to go. You guys were the ones who don't have faith. You're going to hold this man in a place of, of, of discouragement and sadness. And I ain't got time for that. And he doesn't have time for that. So every one of y'all got to go. Then he went into that house with just a few people. And he talked to her. And she rose up and was healed 110%. And Jairus was able to rejoice now. Yeah. Because even though on this journey some things came him his way, Jesus still said, when we have, the Bible still says, when we have an encounter with Jesus... Changes come. Yeah. Are you hearing me this morning? And that's what he wants to do. I could talk about many other people. I just put a couple little names here as I was as I was actually in worship this morning. Some of them, and I put a couple of them last night. But the woman at the well, if you think about her, she needed a change. Yes. And she was sitting and Jesus rode up after walking and being thirsty and said, Hey, give me a drink. And this Samaritan woman wasn't supposed to be talking to him. But Jesus says, hey, let me tell you something. I can, you can drink from this well and you'll get thirsty again. But if you drink from this well, you'll never thirst again. Amen. You'll never thirst again. And this woman had seven people that she was with. And the one that she was with now wasn't her husband. And Jesus called her out on it. And said, basically, the whole town hated The men of the town hated her because she was a home wrecker and being around and doing everything that she was doing. And she ran back to the town. And because this lady needed a time for change, she needed a change. And she had an encounter with Jesus. Right. Man, she started to drink from that living well, that water that doesn't run dry. Yeah. She sprinted back to her town where she didn't have the best reputation. And she started telling everybody, you got to come meet this man. you got to come meet this man. Yeah. you got to come meet this man. And a whole Town was changed yeah. because she had an encounter with Jesus and she was changed. Amen. Are you hearing me this morning? Amen. If you have an encounter with Jesus, you will not be the same. Amen. I know people that are still bitter over stuff. They've been bitter over 10 years ago. That's because you're not having an encounter with Jesus. That's right. You're hanging around Jesus. You're one of the people in the crowd that are thronging around him, but you're not doing everything you can in desperation to get to his garment. Right. You're not blind Bartimaeus on the side of the road saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Shh, be quiet. I don't care what you say. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he got touched and he got healed. I don't know about you. I'm going to be the lady with the issue of blood. I'm going to be Bartimaeus. 
I'm going to have exclamation marks on yeah. the end of my worship and on, on, on the end of my pursuit of God. Amen. You can hang tight and not be changed if you want to. Amen. I'm not. Amen. And, when, and when people saw this, they began to get changed. Yeah. That's what these represented. The other day was change. Saying, have an encounter with Jesus so this stuff can be left here and never be picked up again. Leave it there. Have a real, genuine encounter with the man who opened blind his eyes and brought people from the dead. He's still as real today as he was then. And it's the only thing that brings change. Amen. Amen. Are you with me this morning? Yes, sir. That's what we have to do, man. You could go to all these different things. Paul on the road to Damascus. All these different ones in the Bible. Peter needed a change. And I'll close with this and 14 other scriptures. <laughs> Come on. Peter needed a change. Peter was saved. Hear me. Peter was saved. He didn't have that boldness. He didn't have that, that infilling of the Holy Spirit that allowed him to be bold. He's still worried about people pleasing. He's still worried about what people thought. He's still around his emotions a lot of times. He still had an anger problem. But he was saved. He, he was a good, he would go to heaven if he would have died at that point. He was saved. He followed Jesus. He believed in Jesus. But he needed a change. Some of y'all in here have been saved for a long time, but you need a change. Some of y'all, man, have been bound by things that are hidden and secret, and you need a change. Some of y'all have been walking in pride and arrogance instead of humility and being willing really to put your hands up to heaven and surrender and say, God, I need change. Some of y'all keep holding on to things because it's comfortable. And then if you let go of that, man, now what do you do? You have to depend on Jesus. And I don't see him. And I don't pray enough. And I don't read my Bible enough. And I don't really know what to do. So I'm going to cling. I'm going to let go of all this. I'm going to hold on to this real tight white knuckle it real good because if I let go of this one thing that brings me comfort, that brings me some form of control, man, I feel like maybe I'm, I'm going to be slightly okay. But Jesus says you have to have an encounter with him to be able to release it. Otherwise, it's not possible. Amen. You say, yeah, no, it's not. <laughs> I've never seen it outside of Jesus. I haven't. Have I seen people lay certain things down? Yeah. Have I seen people walk away from it for a, for a minute? Yeah. Have I seen people pretend forgive? Yeah. I, I, I forgive him. No, you don't. I love him. No, you don't. You tolerate it and you show up and you put on a smiley face, but inside you don't like him or her. That's a lot of y'all in here because you haven't had an encounter with Jesus. I even know the people who have that issue with me. But I can love them anyway because I'm seeking God and saying, Lord, it's not, they're not my enemy. They're a victim of the enemy. Yes, that's right. They're walking in this garbage in this Amen. chaos. That's and right. I pray that they have an encounter with Jesus so they can be different too. Amen. That's my heart for them. I'm not losing sleep over any of that. Man, so you think about that man. Paul on the road to Damascus and Peter. I promise you in closing, Peter went up to that upper room. And Jesus told him to do this. He said, there's going to be a change. You guys need something more than what you currently have. So I want you to go up here and I want you to tarry in Jerusalem. This is in Acts chapter 2. I want you to wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. You cannot do any ministry until I empower you. So you have to wait. This is what blows my mind about a lot of different places, man. How, why, how, they, don't, how they don't believe that. It's in the Bible. We can't just skip a chapter and say we just skipped over that one. We don't. Jesus said, wait, wait for it. So they went up in that upper room and they began to come in one mind and one accord, the Bible says. You hear me? That doesn't mean that everyone in here believes everything that I believe. That's not what that meant. It doesn't mean that you have to do everything like I say to do it. It's not what that meant because that's not realistic. We're different. That doesn't mean any of it. It means that their focus was on who? Jesus. Jesus. Their focus was on the one that mattered, not the little differences, not the, I want to lay and pray, I want to stand and pray, I think we should walk and pray, I think we should pray for five minutes, I think we should pray for two hours. It wasn't on any of that, it was on Jesus. And they sat up there in one mind and one accord, and the Greek and the Hebrew for that literally means, everybody breathe in, breathe that. That's what it means. It means they had the same exact breath. They were in perfect rhythm, spiritually. Are you hearing that? Man, they had the same exact breath. What are we supposed to do in a marriage? 
We're supposed to have the same breath. As a wife submits and follows, and as a man leads as he follows God, they begin to have the same breath. Doesn't mean they agree on everything. It means they begin to have the same breath. That's the only way that it works. How does a church function properly? You don't come in here and complain about stuff. That means that you're the one that's getting out of rhythm and God will remove you or he'll bring change to you. But we got to have the same breath. You look at the ones that God has placed up here and you say, God, I got to catch their breath. I got to catch that rhythm. I got to follow it. And when we do that, man, here's what happened. There was a change that came. That rhythm started to come. I know people that's been brought correction by leaders and they don't listen to it and they buck against it and they don't want to make that change. That could be the problem why the change isn't coming. It could be me. It could be you. So we have to have that same breath. We have to listen. We have to grow. And it says when they were up there, all of a sudden, the sound came like a mighty rushing wind. What did that represent? That represented a change in who they were, in their authority, in the boldness that they had, in the confidence that they had, in their ability to overcome life's trials, in their ability to overcome their failures. Even as they were saved, Peter denied Jesus to his face. Because he, would, he was worried about what people thought. Von Bartimaeus at least said, I don't care what they think. I need you. They said, hey, Peter, aren't you with him? And he's like, heck no, I'm not with him. No. Three times. Look, Jesus looked right at him on the third time. Boom. Imagine that. The dude you walk with, he looks right at you. And you're like, I don't know him. Then you lock eyes like, oh, no. And he ran. He didn't even go watch him be crucified. He ran. He went back to fishing. And Jesus showed up and they're in this room and he says, Terry, wait for it. And that same Peter who was anger filled, who was, who, was, who was run by his emotions, who had a big mouth, who tried to lead all the time. And oh, I've got an S on my chest. Peter, look at me. I'll cut his ear off. I'll save the day, Jesus. That same man had a change when that wind blew in that room and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And everybody began to speak in tongues, man. And, and they came up and they started to ridicule and make fun of. You see that happening a lot, people that had an encounter with Jesus. Bartimaeus, Peter, many others, man. And they came up and they were like, man, these people are drunk. It's only the third hour. What are y'all doing? He was like, we're not drunk. And he started to preach with the boldness about Jesus and about overcoming. And you can go read it in that, this, this, this sermon that he preached with an absolute boldness. And it went from 120 people that had the same breath. Hear me. Changed Peter in a way that he spoke a couple weeks after denying Jesus to his face. And 3,000 people were added to the church in that moment. Yes. That's the change that takes place when we have an encounter with the one who came down from heaven and lived as a man, experienced every temptation that we'll ever experience, but yet was out with, with was without sin, died, buried, resurrected, ascended to heaven. When we believe that, Amen. there's a change that takes place in our life. How are these girls going to change and stay changed? What I'm talking about. Without an encounter with Jesus, we're all wasting our time with food and the house and the bills and spending your time and your time and our curriculum. Without an encounter with Jesus, where you're willing to push through anybody and anything just to touch the hem of his garment, we're all wasting our time. But Jesus said, when you do that and you have that encounter, I'll only change the storm situation. I'll change anything that's taken root in you, like this demonic possession. He says, I'll change your family circumstances where your kids may be dying, maybe not physically, maybe spiritually. I'll run to where they're at and I'll speak life to them. I'll reach out to where they are, even when it doesn't seem like it's going to happen. I'll get there and I'll make it happen because that's what Jesus is about. He's about change. Amen. Man, and I've been stirred up this week. I preach these messages on personal revival. And I'm looking at my life and saying, God, what's going on in me? I preach these messages. It's a stirring. So what's going on in me that's different? Man, and God started to speak to my heart. And it was so exciting this week as I started. And then last night, it was even better. When he started speaking to me, all these different people, I even asked her, I said, who's someone in the Bible that you can think of that needed a change? And, and she said, uh, she was speaking about nations. And I'm like, whoa, I didn't even think on that big with Esther and all these different ones. Man, Nehemiah saw that there needed to be a change and a whole city was rebuilt. Listen, a nation has been changed by one person. 
many times in the Bible. This city has 10,000 people of East Liverpool. Wellsville ain't even a town, it's a village. Because it's so small. We don't think if we get this in our hearts and we have encounters that our families, our communities, our school systems, everything that's around us can drastically change and be set on fire and every one of them can follow Jesus just like Bartimaeus did. This is gospel. This isn't Josh. This is what the Bible says. This is what's been implanted into my heart. This is the very thing that's transformed my life from putting 30 bags of dope in my body a day and shooting crack in there and not believing that there's any hope for somebody like me to being filled with the Holy Ghost, set free in 13 years clean of any kind of drug or alcohol. This is somebody that's been on both sides of the spectrum and know that without Jesus being real, the last thing that I would ever call myself is a Christian. Man, but if he's real and his Holy Spirit's real and we can continue to change and God's no respecter of persons, then what is our problem? Come on. We just like what we like, amen? We don't like, who in here likes change? Nobody. We don't like change, but Jesus calls us to change. Amen. He calls us out of that blindness. He calls us out of that stagnant life. He calls us out of that storm. He calls us out of that boat. He calls us out of all those situations and he says, now I'm going to empower you in a way where everybody around you is going to be affected for Jesus. If you want that this morning, you can have that. But it's up to you to say, man, I'm ready to have an encounter. I'm not going to sit in my seat for 30 minutes, 40 minutes anymore and walk out of here and say, good, good talk. Good talk, preacher. Amen. A little golf. Everybody give a golf clap. Good talk. That's what we do in most church services. Good talk. That was good. Damn, that was good. Next week, what would you preach on? Uh, good, good talk. <laughs> good job. Good talk. Man, but when we have an encounter, we will remember it forever. Forever. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open up this altar this morning. I don't need to pray for anybody, but mom, will you put something on it? I know there's things in your life that need to change. I know there's places in your life that you need to receive change. I know there's people in here that are filled with the Holy Ghost. And you say, man, I want to have that power in my life to change. Maybe that's you. Man, if you come up and have an encounter with Jesus, if you picture yourself in that room like that, man, God, what's in my room that's not letting me be able to go out of here? What issue do I have? that's keeping me from being able to be a part like I want to be what's keeping me shame filled and sitting on the side of the road begging for anything that can help me you know a common theme that I've heard from everybody who comes to Christ especially through addictions and rehabs that this is my last resort I didn't try to this was my last resort so was the lady with the issue of blood 